I wish I could be with you in the Bomo. Because number one, it's a lovely place. It's a beautiful place. And I'm sure there's very interesting company here. Unfortunately, I can't make it. What's perhaps unique about my background is that I have been accidentally, it wasn't planned, part of situations, been having professional jobs that are typically mutually exclusive. I've been a central banker, been involved in the design of the euro as a central banker. I've been an offshore currency fund manager. I've been an academic and I've been president of an electronic payment system. I've been working with some of the largest multinationals on the planet. And I've been working with some of the poorest countries on this planet. Every one of these angles has every time given me a way of looking at money in a way that wasn't visible from the other angles. Humanity faces an extraordinary series of unprecedented challenges. From my perspective, I think climate change is one, the number one. The second one would be the aging of the societies, many places in the world, including Western Europe, but not only. Asia is on the same path. We have the monetary instabilities, uh, under the current system. And we have structural unemployment because the technology that we have today uh, actually can have growth, economic growth, without jobs. The conventional money is incompatible with uh, sustainability. It has a number of implicit, automatic programs that are incompatible with that. One of them is, for example, short-term thinking. The second one is that the way money is created, um, it is pro-cyclical. In other words, it increases the business cycle. The third one is that it brings all the users in competition with each other, which is not the best way to operate in certain environments. Competition is good, but having only competition is not good. It's also incompatible with uh, social capital. Nature does not look for maximum efficiency. It looks for a balance between efficiency on one side and resilience on the other. And if that balance is not correct, if you only drive for efficiency, you're going to have a very fragile system. If you have an overemphasis on resilience, you're going to have stagnation. So we need a balance. And conventional money is extreme efficient. The challenges that I have mentioned, I claim none of them can be addressed within the current monetary paradigm i.e. with a single currency created through bank debt with interest. None of that is feasible. With complementary currencies, one can address every single one of them. Money is an important leverage point. It's actually, I claim, is the most important, the most powerful leverage point because it changes the motivation system. We need to rethink the motivation system that makes it possible to address those challenges. A complementary currency is a medium of exchange other than conventional money that people use within a particular community. So there's a wide variety of such uh, complementary currencies. The oldest ones, and already 40 years old, or what I call loyalty currencies. For example, the frequent flyer miles of the airlines, which started 40 years ago, uh, provide a motivation to change behavior, i.e. take the same airline. 
Uh, and today every supermarket has it too, return to the same shop. These commercial currencies are useful for the airline or for the other shops that use loyalty currencies, but they don't really do anything for society. And what I'm really talking about is using this technology which is proven, which is in fact established 40 years is enough time, a technology that is characteristic of the information age, but apply them for things that do make a difference. Changing behavior towards the environment, changing behavior to other people, changing behavior in social settings, uh, motivating people to do things that they wouldn't do spontaneously. And there's a long list of things that this could apply to and what it's needed. We need to change behavior in a very, very large scale rather quickly. And the alternative is basically a regulation or force prohibiting people to do things, obliging people to do things. With a currency, you can make it attractive. It's the pull as opposed to a push. And that's a lot more powerful and a lot more effective. The big advantage of complementary currencies is you choose your objectives and you can design the currency that specifically motivates and changes behaviors in the direction that you're trying to motivate. If you want to motivate people around the world, having a complementary currency that specifically aims these behavior patterns is exportable anywhere in the world and you can actually bring everybody on board. The difference between the past and today is this. There are more people on the planet having mobile phones than bank accounts, by far. And the cost for these things today, for 20, 30 bucks, you can have a system that can actually make a payment system of a global nature if you want to. So that's the future for complementary currencies and for conventional money. With the information age, we can now design much ch cheaper and much more universal payment systems that will have multiple currencies than we could ever do before. And that's why I claim that it's possible to do, to do things in a, in the com with complementary currencies that on a scale and that has never been available before. That's fortunate because we will need it on a scale that was never made in the same way in the past as well. My drop in the ocean is an interesting pioneer model. I want to encourage experimentation. I want to encourage improvements. I want to encourage diversity. And my drop in the ocean is part of that. And it's part of it in a specific field where there's not a hell of a lot of interesting things happening otherwise. We also need to actually start doing work on the mainstreaming economy with businesses and the relationship between businesses and citizens and consumers. And that is what my drop in the ocean is tackling. The leverage of changing the money system is making it possible not only to address the challenges, but actually create a world that I describe as sustainable abundance. There is no reason that there should be scarcity in everything. We can create a planet of sustainable abundance even for 10 billion people, I claim at the condition, the necessary condition, of rethinking our money. It's not a sufficient condition. I'm not claiming it's enough to change the money that everything else will lose the place. We still need education, we still need regulation, we still need other things to get us there. But I claim it's a necessary condition. Without touching the money system, we have no chance of, in a period of 10, 15, 20 years, to have a planet that we want to live on.